Well, welcome, everyone. I think Catherine thought it would be helpful if we if we kind of went around the room and just introduced ourselves. So uh, I'm David, and I've flown here from uh, Lisbon, Portugal, and this is my second visit to South Africa. I came about four years ago in uh, 2014 or so, maybe four or five, going on five, and uh, so. I hope we have a wonderful experience together today. Yeah. yeah, and I'm Svava and I came with David from Lisbon, Portugal. And uh, yeah, I'm just so grateful to be here. It's my first time in South Africa. Mm. And uh, yeah, I'm very looking forward to this. Thing. From Iceland, yeah. Yeah, I'm originally from Iceland, yeah. Oh. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Mm, that's the other, yeah. end, of, <laughs> the other end of the globe. <laughs> Iceland and South Africa, you got, yeah. you got it covered there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. Hi, I'm Lisa, and I'm originally from Scotland, but I've been living here for 10 years. Um, and this is Kira, and I'm very excited to hear what you have to say to me. Yeah. Yeah. I'm Robin. I live in Johannesburg. I'm also very, very excited and Absolutely happy to be here. Thank you so much. Thank mm. you, Catherine. Oh, it's, a pleasure. Um, it's really wonderful. And thank you, everybody. It's so nice to mm. meet you all and be here. Oh. It's a special day. Mm. So thank you. Well, I'm Louise, and i um, very grateful to Catherine for getting this going. I'm very grateful to Dave for <laughs> coming here. I, I did see you four or five years ago, and um, I'm back for more. <laughs> My name is Crano. Um, I've been a teacher for a very long period, which isn't a sign of seniority, just saying I'm taking longer to get the message. <laughs> and uh, it's so nice to be in a group that I didn't haven't organized. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't organized this evening. <laughs> it just well, happened. <laughs> <laughs> Being the yeah. conduit through which it happened. Yeah. I'm really grateful to be here and to be sharing the room with other teachers in a unified message. So I'm looking forward to that. Beautiful. Thanks, Beautiful. I'm Anton. I'm a friend of Craner's here from Cape Town. I'm hap uh, happy to be here. I've, uh, I know a lot about the, 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 the subject that uh, Crano over the years, and we know he's had a for like 50 years. So, but I've never been to a actual course of medical discussion, so I'm very excited. Um, uh, my name is Lindy. Um, with Catherine, yes, thank you very much for organizing. I've been waiting for a long time. <laughs> and um, yeah, I was having such a giggle because of the timing. I was having such a giggle with the Holy Spirit this morning. <laughs> so yeah, I'm having a fabulous day. It feels like Christmas today for me. So yeah, I'm just very happy to be here. And I'm Matthew, I'm the camera guy, <laughs> and I don't know what any of this is about. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Catherine introduced me to the course earlier on this year, so I'm quite new at it, but uh, thoroughly enjoying the journey. Changed my life. Looking forward to today. My name is Elena. I'm, uh, I've been living here for 10 years. I'm originally from Kazakhstan. So, um, I'm super happy to be here. It's I started to do Course in Miracles. It's like, you yeah, know, miracles and miracle and miracle and miracles. Just beautiful. And here we go. Thank you. Beautiful. I'm so happy. Beautiful. I'm Denise. Um, also loved the course for hundreds of years. We've been, been through it a few times. Was in your lovely energy four to five years ago. So I was thrilled because I had to drive Louise here. She had her eye up. Thursday. I'm so happy that you brought me here. Yeah. <laughs> the chauffeur. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I'm so happy to be back in your energy and mm. energy again. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, I'm Catherine. Yeah, and this is just it's so it was all very spontaneous. You know, people like thank you, thank you. I, I didn't really I really didn't do anything actually, you know. It's all just been orchestrated. Um, and I feel very, very blessed to have you here and to have everyone else here because it's like through the questions that we all just expand, you know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Thanks, David. Yeah. 
it. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. Okay, I'm Silvana. I'm Catherine's mum. I have to admit, I'm the odd one out. I don't know anything about this <laughs> miracles at all. Um, so I've, I'm really keen to hear what you have to say um, about it. Before one will get trained. Yeah, that's me. Beautiful, mm. beautiful. Yeah. So it all seems to start from an invitation, I guess, for all of us, just an invitation of our hearts. Because I think we all want happiness and peace and joy, and we want to have a good life, really. We're, and we're navigating this world, and it's quite a, a trip, uh, to say the least. A lot of us have gone through a lot of uh, very intense experiences and and sometimes have been curious about the mind and how it works and but even coming here this came from an invitation Catherine was on uh, we were doing online shows and retreats and uh, we're talking one day and uh, she was just expressing you know things that she would love to work through and clear and uh, and just before that uh, going on the air on that television show or online retreat, I was just saying, well, you know, I've been traveling for probably, I don't know, maybe three decades all around the world, and so this has been so common for me of just going where I'm invited. There's no point in trying to convince anybody of anything, because uh, it's just not the way it works. Um, we're always coming to our own insights and clarity and there aren't any special people people that have more of the answers it's all inside of us and when we come together with open-mindedness just to be able to talk about anything question everything nothing's taboo nothing's off limits uh, you know you can just come at it and that's what I love about uh, traveling around the world and doing these public gatherings because uh, I always say it's all for me. It's it, I'm just teaching and learning, and and I'm just here to be clear. And uh, and Jesus has said in the Bible, "Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God." And many of us are quite curious about this purification. Hmm, pure of heart. That sounds very curious. How do we do that? And wow, if we could actually actually do it, then perhaps happiness and joy and love and all the things that we desire to experience consistently, constantly, perhaps that's even possible. This world has a lot of uh, perceptions and there's a lot of memories and there's a lot of um, clouds of seeming darkness that arise in our awareness as we even ponder the possibility of purification and there's all kinds of issues that arise betrayal, abandonment, feelings of mistreatment, and even subtle, like, oh gee, they didn't even smile, or, you know, it doesn't matter whether we're in traffic or at a restaurant, we, our eyes and ears pick up the smallest little things. And uh, there's something in our, in our hearts that is hoping for happiness and joy, and, uh, and there's a bit of heartache when there's not that experience, almost like we're not living our full potential, or we're not fully there. Wherever there is, we sometimes feel like I'm not there yet. And I, I would say that it does take a dedication, a devotion, a discipline. That's what teaching really is about, is we're just teaching ourselves, but it's a, I think of teaching as a means of conversion, not for converting people or saving people, but just purifying coming, oh, I, I could have been a little more kind there, gentle, like, hmm, what was I so frustrated with there? Pondering those things, questioning, like the ancient Greeks, you know, they, I was always inspired by the ancient Greeks because they would basically sit around in the bathtub all day long, pondering what's the purpose of it all. And, <laughs> and meanwhile, the neighbors, the Romans were out conquering and <laughs> taking baths, swaths of land, you know, and and the Greeks were, really didn't seem much concerned about what was being conquered or how big the Roman Empire was. They were still in the bathtub, uh, <laughs> still talking about what is the nature of life. And I always liked that. And interestingly enough, I have had, I've enjoyed a hot bath here at Catherine's house. I have had hot tubs. 
I've even had meetings where people where we just sit around and ponder and have our meetings in hot tubs uh, for some hours till the, the fingers were all wrinkly. And people have told me, they've come up and they said, you know, if we could just get the United States uh, Senate and uh, House of Representatives to adopt uh, your method and the ancient Greeks, I think perhaps we could come to a better resolution of things and, and come to more happiness. But we put so much time into attaining, achieving, trying to be successful, trying to overcome some sense of lack or unworthiness that we feel. We do it with relationships, we do it with careers. We find all kinds of ways to cover over uh, some kind of inner wound that apparently, uh, like with a wound, a cut on the skin, it needs the sunlight and the air to heal. Apparently our mind, our consciousness is quite similar, that, that it needs exposure. It needs, you know, like letting, letting the emotions up, letting the thoughts up, getting in touch with what's going on in a very deep way. So that was, I just became aware of that, you know, when I was like in, I think in my 20s, it started to become aware that, that that was the meaning of life, it was to be happy. It was like Joseph Campbell, who was well read and an amazing man, had said, follow your bliss. But how do you follow your bliss if you've got something inside that's blocking the way? Kind of like uh, in the Matrix movie, Matrix where uh, Morpheus says, it's a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. A splinter? Hmm, that's a pretty strong metaphor, a splinter, like a splinter of wood in your mind, driving you mad. Because when you get a splinter in the skin, it can be very tiny, but once it gets under your skin, it's very, very uncomfortable, and yet it's not very obvious. Sometimes you can even look and go, what is that stab? Because the splinter is out of sight. So, for me, the questioning mind, I mean, I was very curious, I was inquiring, and I really am very much like the other seven billion. Uh, we always, from time to time, do ask some of those deeper questions. What's it all about? How did I get here? What's the meaning of life? What is my purpose in life? Do I have a mission? Is there something I'm supposed to accomplish? Is it just about being happy, is that really the goal of life? Uh, and, and, and amazing, in, on this planet, in this city, <laughs> if that's the goal, well, I, I maybe would need a lot of help, internal help, um, and help coming in any way possible through signs and symbols and meetings and books and movies and music and all kinds of things. So I, I feel like that's kind of the way my life has gone, and and then um, I was already inquiring and, and studying lots of philosophies and psychologies and spiritualities uh, before A Course in Miracles came across my path, and then when the Course came it seemed to just accelerate. It was almost like a, a prayer, like, can, can this be somehow systematic? Is that asking too much that I feel like this is a hit or miss? Um, leaves no stone unturned, and it's very tedious, time-consuming, and long. It seems like it's going so slow, like I'm, I'm the turtle, and in my mind my, I'm moving so slow, and the Course was more an answer to a prayer, like, can this be systematic, can I speed this up? So for me, it's, it's a very intimate experience I've had, and again, it's just a book, a book among books, so it's just words. And I have discovered over the years that it's not really words that get you to happiness. Um, the words can be used by presence or by spirit, by your intuition, but they're just like tools. They're very crude. It would be like trying to plow a field, you know, using a toothbrush. Um, <laughs> you know, you could possibly plow the field with a toothbrush, but it would probably take you a lot of years, maybe tens of thousands of years to plow the field with the edge. And you might break the toothbrush actually in the process. And I feel like um, I was raised Christian, I was told about the power of prayer, 
Um, our family prayed around meals, but they were very ritualistic. You know, God is great, God is good, and we thank God for our food. Food, make it rhyme. You know, when you're a kid, you're just like, let's get on with the meal. But, you know, you know, there's, there was a sense of prayer, but they seemed very ritualistic. It wasn't like, um, it didn't have a lot of depth to it. Guidance? Hmm. Not in my Christian household. Um, there were, you know, occasionally you might hear a sermon where the minister in the church would say prayers are answered. But we were usually just praying around the food or praying for a relative who was sick. But it wasn't like something that we relied on. It was more like a, an ornament that was on a tree. It wasn't really the tree. It, I didn't have a prayer life at all. And I would say as I've gone deeper in this journey, after 10 years of university and all these philosophies and all the different science and all the things I've studied, I now have much greater appreciation for the power of the mind and the power of prayer. And, and before I, I just dismissed the whole topic and said, and now I like more the Buddhists um, just meditating and receiving. I associated prayers basically with words. And I would be saying, well, like, why am I praying to God and does God really, are really all these thousands and millions of words going, <laughs> going up or thoughts going up, is that making a difference in anything? Or is it more like the Buddhists would say, meditation, still your mind, open up to receive, more of a receptive uh, kind of thing. So I actually, in my college years, swung more and more toward the, the meditation. I was much more drawn to meditation. Prayer was still that kind of Christian thing that people do and whether it works or not, who knows. But through working with the Course, now I do see that, that prayer is synonymous with desire. And if our mind is truly powerful, and it is, that everything we perceive in the entire world and cosmos is a motion picture of the prayer of our heart. Whatever we've got going on, if we see conflict, there's some conflict going on in our prayers, in our desire. If we see joy and happiness and love and witnesses to that, then our prayers are for that joy and happiness and for miracles. And, and it's all coming back to our, the power of our desire. So I actually, when I was in uh, school, my mother was a teacher and that was kind of an interesting thing, being in junior high and high school in the same building with your mother, who was always talking to all the other teachers and I felt like I had like 200 <laughs> eyes on me wherever I would go. <laughs> if I was late for class or anything, I, I was, felt like I was a bit under the microscope. But I do see that that the the power of prayer, accepting the power of our minds, is, is the step towards that peace of mind. It's not so much the words. God knows the prayer of your heart before you utter a single word. God knows the prayer of the heart before a single thought whizzes by. The, the prayer is for happiness. The prayer is for joy. The prayer is for peace of mind. And yet, if we have other things on the altar, we want for other things, in addition to that peace of mind and happiness and joy, there's some problems that seem to arise. And we may think they're in the world, but they're consciousness issues. Everything we have to face is a consciousness issue, something we have to resolve within. Or really just see its nothingness. It's not like there's a real problem, but as long as we believe something other than happiness, other than God's will for perfect happiness, then we've got some purification to deal with. And so what these gatherings are, and I actually have been doing more digital ones, Catherine knows, because mm -hmm. um, after those decades and decades of travel, that, that answering the call to come here is, it's really a visitation. I, I, you know, sometimes they say, Buddha visited me, or Jesus visited me, and and people ask me all kinds of questions in these gatherings, you know, I mean, I've heard it all, but can, can you, uh, once somebody said, can you bilocate? 
uh, can you be in two different places at the same time? <laughs> and I said, oh heavens, I bilocate, that's too small, I, I multi-locate. <laughs> I said, people write to me and they said I show up in their dreams and I talk to them and they tell me these long dreams of all these interactions we have, and have bunches of them, and so I said, I'm in many dreams and many places and I'm reaching many people far beyond what seems to be this form, I bilocate, I'm, I'm a multi-locator, but it's not a location in terms of, of a person, it's just um, when, when Krishna shows up, you know, or when Jesus shows up, or Mary, or an elephant, you know, depending on, for the Hindus or whatever, these are just symbols, and the symbols are just a way of reaching the mind that has a, a curiosity, a question, it's got a prayer, it's asking for something. And so I just see that this form is just another symbol among symbols, and it varies depending on who's dreaming. Really, ultimately, there's just one of us dreaming. And that's an exciting discovery, because when you start to get closer and closer to the idea that there's only one dreamer, and one dream, then you can start to come back to full responsibility for everything in the experience that the dreamer is going through. You're not going to project it out like some groups I do and they go, who, who's dreaming? Am I in your dream or, or are you in my dream? And I said, no, that's, that's really not a helpful question because it's just a trick to think that there's seven billion of us with separate consciousnesses and separate minds and separate thoughts and that each of us has our own private dream going on because that's where the conflict comes in. Private dreams seem to clash and I always say no two people see the same world. It, it seems like there are areas of agreement, we may say, oh the grass is green, the sky is blue, you know, you can call them what you want, traffic lights, robots, but they, you know, they have lights and, you know, we, there's some, we are, seem to be seeing the same things, but yet, to someone, and there are many people in this world that are colorblind, if you came in with your, the grass is green, the sky is blue, they, what are you talking about, <laughs> you know, there's, there is no universal agreement, and that starts to be a, a tip, that there's some trick of a consciousness going on, where there's the illusion of separation. It's the illusion that there are separate people with private minds and private thoughts. Once I discovered that that was just a trick, then I was like, okay, okay, all right, that's, that's, that's interesting. There's one mind, there's only one of us, but it seems like it's multiple. And then I started seeing it when I studied quantum physics, I'd see the same thing. And I'd study the Advaita Vedanta or deep teachings from China, non-dual teachings. I would see the same message coming through in all of these different ways, that there's only one of us. And the trick is the illusion of separation, where the conflict comes in. And so, I was like, okay, alright, alright, sentimentally, sentimentally, <laughs> I can go for this oneness stuff. But, I want to have an experience that, that shows me for once and for all that this is really the way it really is. That reality is love. And that anything other than love is the illusion. Whereas the Beatles said, all you need is love. You know, that it really, that would be the prayer of the heart. It would be for, for divine love. Actual divine, unchanging divine love. And so then, for me, it got to the point where I started to work with the Course and I would go very deep and I would have my grievances and my issues with different people and so forth. And then at one point, after many years, and I should say, um, I came across the Course in 86 and it took me about three years before I had this steady stream of thought in my mind, it was Jesus, conversationally speaking to me. Not just, I, I'm with you always till the end of time and love your neighbor and that kind of stuff from the Bible, the red letters in the Bible. But I mean, call so and so, you know, turn right here, go here, go there. This 
conversational Jesus in my mind. It was like a little bird on my shoulder just chatting away, very relaxed. You know, did you hear that? Did you hear what they just said? That you pay attention to that. It's very important. And and I started getting like a, a very friendly, gentle commentary. It wasn't like an audible voice, but it was a, a clear stream of thoughts that was not David's. There was another channel there, and this channel didn't seem to have any static. Never got upset. This channel was so loving and gracious, it was almost like, wow, this is, I've tapped into what I found to be an easy life. Because when you're in, tapped into guidance and tuned into the Holy Spirit or Jesus or call it intuition, whatever you want to call it, Atman, you know, it goes by different names, then, then that is practical. That's not love you one another, that is like day by day, moment by moment. It's time to get up. No, it's time to get up. You know, or sometimes it was quite firm. Uh, Swava actually had Jesus appear to her. What seems like when it's something really important, then Jesus actually appears mm. to you and is quite firm yeah. in you must. You know, th this is it's. <laughs> it's now. <laughs> it's now. now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like when she first met me, she we were in uh, Holland, Holland, but she was sharing last night the story with Catherine that um, that you didn't really want to have a close-up meeting with me, but apparently Jesus did want, uh, arranged want that, it. arranged that. Yeah. You might share a little bit about how that worked. Yeah, it was, uh, um, yeah, I can just share some of it, it's a bit long, but yeah, I was, uh, we was having the first movie gathering, and I was sitting in the front, and uh, then I heard this voice, Jesus' voice speaking to me and said, now I have arranged it for you. Now you go and speak to David. And David had just walked in the room and went into the next room. And uh, I, was, I was so afraid, so shy, and it took me a lot to just get there to Holland. I had never traveled on my own and so much fear coming up, all kinds of stuff. So I was sitting, too, wasn't it was in like 50, 57 people. 57 wow. people. Yeah. It was a big group, not yeah. like this. <laughs> and I was sitting on the chair and I said, no way, I'm not going. I was holding my hands to the chair and then I heard, it's now. And then I just started walking. It was like I was not in control of the body. It's just, <laughs> yeah. And then yeah. I spoke to David. And, yeah. and there have been a lot of times in my life where it, it does seem at times it seems to be almost quite firm because there's a resistance there mm -hmm. and there's something that seems to be important somehow for the whole world uh, even though that sounds crazy it sounds uh, narcissistic or something but somehow it's a bigger plan and there's something that's really important and I've just had lots and lots and lots and lots and lots over these last decades of those kind of experiences where things before, you know, they talk about B.C. and A.D. I say B.C. is before Christ, <laughs> you know, the same. And uh, instead of uh, B.C. and A.D., it's B.C. before the Course and after the Course. Uh, did you see this movie? Oh yeah, David, I saw it, but it was B.C. <laughs> uh, it was before the Course. Yeah. Then I saw the movie after the Course, and they, they, they just talk about B.C. and A.C. <laughs> Well, that's the way kind of my life was. B.C., before Christ, you know, it was like um, like a human life of, of wading through the complexities of relationships, the complexities of survival, the complexities of your environment. You know how it is in, in Joburg. You know, it's seemingly a very culturally mixed environment, which I actually have found... Um, accelerates your spiritual growth. I mean, I, I've gone all over the world. I've been on many, six or seven continents and countries and multiple times, much more than even twice with South Africa. I always say, I, I usually stop at places that are on the way, and South Africa is right on the way to Antarctica. <laughs> the only problem is, I don't, I've never been to Antarctica, so <laughs> it's not on the way. You know. Hawaii, I flew over like seven times when I'm going to Australia from from the United States, and then finally the people were like, land, 
land <laughs> you would just stop flying over seven years of flying over Hawaii. You know, so they were like the ten years they were like, stop, <laughs> land the plane. But but for me, the the context is that once I made contact with with Jesus in a very conversational, relaxed, direct way, in in a very specific way, shall I say, not just love you one another, but like uh, it's like the prayer of the heart. If I make no decisions by myself, this is the day it will be given me. Or, I think one of the deepest prayers could be, Holy Spirit, decide for God for me. It's like you give, like in the program, mm -hmm. 12 Steps, giving your day over to the higher power and saying, I need help and I'm going to do a lot better today if the higher power is in charge and not the personality self. Because it's pretty wild with the, per the ego in charge. So there came a point where I just was like, okay, I really see that that this guidance is important. And and Jesus said, well, you say that it's important, but you don't have, even have a clue of what that means. Like he said, I need to be in charge of everything. And I said, everything. The bank account? Yes. Relationships? Yes. <laughs> With my mom, my dad, yes. Grandmother, yes. My dog, yes. Cat, everything. I mean, I need to be in charge of everything. And the thing about it is, he told me initially, he said, you know, you've, you've had all this schooling, kindergarten, grade school, junior high, high school, and then you threw 10 years of university, 10 years of uni on top, including grad school. And he's like, we've got a lot of work to do. You've learned... <laughs> a lot of stuff that's actually not going to be very helpful for peace of mind. Mm -hmm. It may, you may be successful in the world, but you're not. This isn't the way to peace of mind. You've learned, you've over learned. You're one of these learning cases. You're a slow learner and now you've been going in the wrong direction for, since you, 27 years. And now I'm going to have to do a reverse with you. I mean a complete 360 reverse to show you that you can trust me for everything and I will take care of everything, but you're going to have to work for me now. Not work for university professors for grades and projects, and not work for companies. You're, you're mine. And, and I actually said yes to that offer, you know. I said, uh, okay, I'll do it. I'll give everything. And by everything meaning all my thoughts of the future, all my ambitions, all my desires for things in the world, you know, it was, it was a leap. It was, to, that's putting it small, it was a leap of faith because all that conditioning and learning has said, you, the only thing that's going to get you out of trouble is your past learning. You need to be a good judge. The course curriculum, the world's curriculum is learn to be a good judge so you can judge between what's helpful and harmful, and use your past learning to navigate time and space based on this past learning. And basically Jesus said, that is not going to work. And he said, I know because I tried it, and I came a new direction. I came uh, the intuitive route of following the Spirit. And that's made all the difference. That's the road not taken uh, that Tom Scott Peck and, and uh, different ones have talked about. So. Basically, that was the point where it turned into, an ex like Gandhi would say, an experiment with truth. Experiment with guidance. Can I really trust this guidance? Can I really trust you with everything? And that really has made all the difference because that's the, where the AC, after Christ, comes in. Where it has been, there have been tr trials, there have been tribulations, but those trials and tribulations came from wanting to be right about some kind of interpretation or perspective based on my past learning. Uh, in every single case, the upset was not about something that was happening to me, but it was something that I was interpreting. And many of us can look at our earthly lives and go back. We do re revisit relationships and we revisit different places and times. And sometimes we think, hmm, could, could I have made another choice 
And in form, really, it's that we can't, but in mind, in our perception of the situation, we can. But it takes a lot of training and discipline to see from a holistic perspective, from a higher perspective than from a personality perspective. It takes an enormous amount of mind training. But somehow, back then in the, in the 1980s, I actually felt that that was a decision before me. That I had to let go of all my ideas at the time that I associated with David about the future. And just say, okay, I'll trust. You be the one in charge. I would but follow. I will be your follower. They call you the way, the truth, and the life. Okay, that's a pretty big title. <laughs> that's a pretty big title, considering this world, you know. Let's just say I say, yes, 100% <laughs> to that. Yes, yes, I say yes, I will follow, I will go for that, and I will be willing to let go of anything that I've ever thought of trying to control this world. Isn't that basically the serenity prayer in the 12-step program? Mm -hmm. Isn't the serenity prayer the key to not only sobriety, but the key to happiness, to love and joy, giving over to a higher power and saying, whatever I've tried to do in this world, it's unmanageable. And it's not only, I was talking with Catherine, we were talking about the program and I would say, thing I love about the program in 12 Steps is that people who come into a realization that there's this intense addiction, that it's so extreme and it's so intense that you can't and you won't push it aside anymore. You, there's something in your heart that just cries out like, I need help. I really need help. And I'm on my knees wanting that help. So I would say as I traveled around the world, I met people from the program, 12 Steps all over the world, and, and they would tell me all their, they would give their, their lead to me, and they would tell me everything that they went through. And I would, Jesus would have me listen very carefully, and then uh, Jesus would say, do you notice the, the ones that make it to that extreme point and fall down on their knees are closer to me? They're not in reality, in heaven, but I mean in terms of awareness, the ones that, that crash, the ones that are in extreme pain and give their life over, are closer. They're, he, he said, they're only one step removed from reality. And then he said, and then the ones that are two step removed from reality are the ones that have seemingly made it in the world. They've adapted to the world's laws of success, fame, fortune, beauty, all the, the trappings of the ego and its make-believe matrix fictitious world. And those are the ones that are, get, are seemingly successful. What Jesus was saying, they're twice removed from reality. They've, they bit the bait of the temptation, of the illusion, of the snake in the, the Garden of Eden. They, they went for the bigger, better, faster, more route instead of the be humble, be still and know that I'm God route. The judge not lest you be judged route. You know, the forgive and you shall be forgiven route. He was saying, oh I, my teachings were very clear 2,000 years ago and, and it's not that the teachings haven't been given, but they haven't been practiced. You know, he took the Ten Commandments and he said, here I'll simplify it for you. The first two are the most important. If you can love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind, and love thy neighbor as thyself, that's your fast track to the kingdom of heaven or to the I amness that you are. But when you go the other route, it's it's long, it's convoluted, it's complex, it's difficult, it's a struggle, and that's what we call the human condition, is the, that second route. So. It was a convincing job, but I would have to say that that through working this and working the Course and working the practicing forgiveness, it has left me in a state where I'm so 
in the moment. I so just enjoy the, this moment that we're all sharing right now. So joy the, the vibrancy, the joy, the happiness, the glee of, of this moment. I see it as kind of a, even like a quantum moment that, that all of us seem to choose to come here for whatever motives, but there's a purpose for us. It's not a random act, it's not a, a, an accident that we're all here in, in the experience because it's the prayer of our heart. And this is an answer. Just this gathering, just exactly the way it is with every sight and sound and person here and every blade of grass and every flower, it's all part of a destined plan that we're just receiving what deep down we have asked for. And what I find in this state of mind is that I have really no interest in outcomes. You know, when people say, who won, who lost, which country invaded which country, who won which war, and who lost, who's breaking up, who's making up, who's getting married, who's getting divorced. You know, these things seem to be big time things in the world, because they've been just given uh, meaning, and there's been meaning invested in them. But the deeper you go into forgiveness, it's a state of acceptance. It's a state of, let all things be exactly as they are. It's a state of, all things work together for good. There are no exceptions. Uh, yesterday I was, just before I was going to bed last night, I just looked at my phone and they said, an entire town in Northern California had burned to the ground. And the town was called Paradise. Mm -hmm. And I thought, hmm, interesting name. But the, the people were like grabbing their, their babies, trying to jump into cars, and trying to get out of town, and the, the fire just ripped through the whole town of Paradise, and just burned it to the ground. And this morning I'm on a call, a Skype call, and a friend of mine had a, a ranch down, he's got all kinds of neighbors, Hollywood stars that are friends of his, Nicolas Cage, and all these people, and basically uh, his ranch had um, burned to the ground, and he had all kinds of you know, rare, like flutes and and artwork. He was a collector and everything that was so you know it was a, it was a big let go. He was just going through the process of letting go. Part of the human condition, and I would say the core of it, is really this belief in loss. And at one point in the Course in Miracles, Jesus says basically, you have many strange beliefs. Many strange beliefs. But perhaps the strangest of them all is the belief that you can lose the ones that you love. Now, he's going to point that out. The strangest of them all is that you can lose the ones that you love. He's starting to poke at that lost belief. And that is a, you could say, that brings the downer in all the time. Loss of possessions, loss of friendships, loss of partners, loss of children, loss of, of air to breathe. You know, I mean, some of the hurricanes and typhoons and if you look at the last number of years in the human race, the, the way the, the weather, the storms seem, seem to get stronger and the, the, the cities get plowed over uh, much, much easier and fires. There was one point not too long ago when it was like, there was like major fires going on. I mean, I had heard about things burning, and then I just went to a, a map from space uh, that, that showed the areas of, on the globe that were burning. And, I, and down here in Africa, I was like, ah. And then I saw Canada, and I, I, Utah, where I have a, a monastery, I could see, I could see on the map the fires, and, and up in Canada with all the forest and everything, and Portugal. I mean, you could see a map of every fire that was active, and it was quite a striking image to me of how much burning was going on this past year, just looking at the map. And then when you throw in hurricanes, floods, everybody remembers that big tsunami over in Thailand, you know, and the images of just of that wave coming in and just smashing. That the frailty and the loss, as long as we believe that we're these bodies, as long as we believe we're here, that can seem like 
people could say, David, don't get too far out. But there's one point in the Course where Jesus says, how can you find joy in a joyless place except by realizing that you are not there? And I was like, oh, is that deep? How can you find joy in a joyous, joyless place except by realizing that you are not there? Um, Catherine was talking too, she, this morning she was sitting over there and she was saying, "There's, I heard you give a talk and there was that woman, uh, Resta, that came and joined with you and then received all these songs from the angels and there was one particular song and I can't remember what the lyrics were but they were so profound and, and this woman joined with me. She would come and have a cup of tea with me every day. She would walk in a big cemetery nearby listening Back in the days, they had cassette Sony Walkmans with little cassettes going. She would listen to hours and hours of my teachings, and then she would come to sit and have a cup of tea with me at my kitchen table. And I would say, boil it down, your struggles and issues, please boil it down to one, one question of the day, let's have a cup of tea. And this morning, she had come in, and she'd sat down for a cup of tea, and she was shaking her head, and I said, hmm, something going on today? And she said, yes, there's something going on. And she said, it's the workbook lesson from A Course in Miracles. And I said, oh, you're having a, a problem with a lesson? And she said, yes, I'm on lesson 132. I said, oh, that's a wonderful lesson. She says, no, <laughs> no, it is not. Jesus has gone too far. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? She says, he's just gone too far. He's gone over the edge. He's, I'll tell you all about it, she said as she sat down to have her cup of tea. She was stirred up. And he's gone way overboard with this. And I said, I said, what is it? And she said, he says there is no world. And, uh, and I said, oh yes. I said, in that lesson he says it a few different ways. One of them is, there is no world apart from what you think. And then he does come out, I remember that one sentence where he says, there is no world, exclamation point. And she's like, that's too far. She, I said, well tell me about it. So she sat down to have a cup of tea. She says, okay, let's talk about that. First of all, how is that practical? How is that practical? That is the most impractical <laughs> line I've ever read in my life. I said, oh, there's quantum physicists that say the same line. You don't scream at them. Paul Davies of, uh, is a quantum physicist down in Australia, and he came to the same conclusion of all of his work with quantum physics, you know, and and atoms and subatomic particles and, and really looking at the space. He said atoms are mostly space, but he was coming to the thing that it's the world's like a mirage that isn't really there. And so the quantum physicists came and said the same thing, and now Jesus says it, and you're all upset, and you say he's gone too far. And she's just like, okay, all right, if you think you know this, then, then you just tell me something helpful. I'm devastated, I think he's off his rocker, he's gone <laughs> way past the point of sanity now, and you're saying he's not, then how am I supposed to live then with this, uh, there is no world? How, is, how, is, why, how do I live? And I said, well that's very simple, you live as if there is no world. What does that mean? What does that mean? I live, but, that's hallucinating. But I live as if there's no world. I said, no, you watch the images, but you start to realize your state of mind is coming from, from within you, from your thoughts. You're in charge. You're in charge of your state of mind. Just like when you're watching a movie, you can be engaged in that movie or detached. You can watch it and just be aware that you're watching a movie, or you can get <coughs> sunk into 
the movie and get all caught up into the dramas by reading all this egoic meaning into the images, or you can live as if there is no world. I, I say, what am I doing here? I'm in a little, looks like a gingerbread house in Cincinnati, Ohio with my cats, and here you are, we have a cup of tea every day, and you're saying you're upset? I don't feel upset. I'm, I'm watching the world, but I'm, I'm not watching the world with judgment. I don't have, I'm not putting ambitions and goals and strivings and like a hard, harsh push to the world. The cats meow, I let the cats in. The cats meow, I give them their food. The cats cuddle me. You know, we have a great <laughs> relationship here because we're not trying to get anything from each other. And I'm not trying to get anything from the world. At that point, I, I'm kind of living like a mystic and I don't have a job, I don't have a career, I'm divinely provided for, my com my companions are my cats, uh, I'm quite content with that, we have a great uh, flowing relationship and it's we're just enjoying it all and I'm just telling her, just live as if there is no world. So she gets up to go, in this little house that I was in, there was two elderly ladies lived there and so one of them couldn't go upstairs, the people that I ended up buying the house from. And so they would put, in a little water closet, they would put a little commode in the water closet on the lower floor. So she goes in, and oftentimes after she would meet with me, she would go for a walk or go to the toilet or whatever, and then she gets these downloads. The angels um, give her songs, sometimes two, three-part harmonies. They give her full-blown songs with you know, different verses and the chorus, and it's like a whole pathway from God would come down to Resta. So she, on this particular day, she goes into the toilet, she comes out, and she's just got a smile on her face, and she said, I need, a, need to get my recorder, because I have to record this song. And the song, the angels called, As If. Because my practical guidance for her was live as if there is no world. So I give her the talk of, you know, just try it, and then the angels give her a whole song. And the song starts out, as if there is no world, as if there is no world. Uh, a cosmic dream, a made-up scheme, where figures dance and swirl, and nothing means a thing, except the truth within, that I am mind by God designed, He's calling me to live as if there is no world. And then uh, the chorus was something like, uh, No longer will I try, no longer will I try adjusting to a lie. Uh, you know, the whole song is from the angels about, this is an egoic world. God didn't create destruction, sin, disease, pain. Suffering, to think a loving God would have anything to do with such a world is as a farce. Even though that kind of overthrows some of Genesis, you know, God, people will come to me who are the Bible, of course I was a Christian, so I know the Bible, and I studied Genesis, and I went to Bible school, and I heard the same things that they read. I read the very same book. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And I thought, well, come on, gives Genesis some credit, it got it, it got it half right. <laughs> God created heaven. <laughs> and the ego projected the earth and time and space and all this other craziness, you know, give them credit, you know, they got half of it right in, the, in Genesis. Sometimes that didn't go over well <laughs> uh, in certain circles, but it was like, you're questioning Genesis and the Bible. And not questioning, I'm telling you the straight fact. Let's call a spade a spade. Let's, 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 let's just straight. And, and these things, you know, of course, uh, when I first came across the course, I, I was out in California when I came back. I was dating, my girlfriend was a fundamentalist Christian. I can only imagine Jesus was just having so much fun. Oh, I give you my whole life, I give you my relationships, I give you all my future, and he's like, thank you, I'm going to have so much fun with you. So much 
healing and forgiveness. Let's go back to your girlfriend now <laughs> and take your course book and you just read it and I'll tell you exactly what to say and do. Yeah, this has been a very spicy life <laughs> experience because it is humorous. You know, when you come through it, it's funny. When you're going through it, it is not funny at all. You are not laughing. And I could see all these situations in my mind where I had a grievance, you know, and it was all just an interpretation. I had, a, later on after that, I would have a Course in Miracles girlfriend, and one time we were getting ready to move in together at this cabin in the woods in Michigan, and, and she was wanting to move her, her stuff um, up there, and I said, sure, sure, whatever, whatever. And, so she's going down to, to get some of her stuff to move up to this house in, in, the, in the woods in Michigan. And she comes in with this guy and she says, oh here's so and so, and I forget his name, he's going to help us, he's helped me moving. Great, hey! And he comes and he brings all the stuff and that was all fine with me until it started to get dark and he said, I gotta be going, I gotta be going. She said, no, no, stay, you stay. And then it went from stay to, um, oh, we're just getting things up. Uh, we only have one bed. Um, we're all sleeping in the same bed. And, <laughs> what? <laughs> it's like the moving guy is suddenly, and then, <laughs> and then we're in this bed, and I'm, she's in the middle laughing with delight, and I'm in the bed with this moving guy and her, and I'm just, and she's going, come on to my cheeks, come on, loosen up a little bit there, and I'm like, well, <laughs> you know, but I, but, with Jesus' help, I could actually <laughs> come higher, and actually view that <coughs> scene as a very comical scene. At the time, it was quite an undoing <laughs> for me. There was a bit of a, some expectations that were being crashed into, but, Later on, with the Holy Spirit and Jesus, I could like see the whole scene and just go, "Oh, that's hilarious! That's that would be like a movie scene that you just get uh, Steve Martin and Chevy Chase and <laughs> <laughs> throw somebody in the middle, you know." But that's what it does to you. Is it's like it's it's a lot of devotion. It's a lot of listen and follow. It's a lot of of just open your heart up to be guided and led in very practical ways. Be a communication instrument, you know, be, you know, I was very shy. I was voted most quiet in my senior class, and so Jesus had a lot to work with, you know, it's like, okay, we got a shy, slow learner here, <laughs> but uh, he'd say, don't worry, Moses stuttered, and you know, we've had to deal with these characters <laughs> throughout history <laughs> that are pretty resistant to delivering the message, and in my case, yeah, I was quite resistant at the beginning, but then the more I trusted, you know, like, like I studied the Course, so I knew the Course like the back of my hand, and I would go to Course groups like in the, in the 1980s, after I got the book in 86, I read it, I would use it as an oracle for two and a half years and would pray my question and then open the book and get my answer, so I wasn't reading it initially chronologically, but I was just using it as an oracle, and then started hearing Jesus speaking to me, and then would go to course groups, and I was telling there was a strange phenomenon that people would read the book, study, and then when they would come to a question, they would, they would, somebody would ask the question in this big course group with no facilitator, just a wide open, long running course group, and then somebody would ask a question and all the heads would turn to the David figure, like, and the answer is, you know, because there was so much clarity and pouring through me at that point, even though it was just the early years with the Course, that, that it was kind of a strange phenomenon. But still, even then, it was like there was so much I know mind, so much past learning, so much pride that was still stuffed in there, that I just, I had no clue how that was going to go. You know, the frustrations of that ego voice just rearing up, and even after a course meeting, it was always, why did you say this? And, you know, very analytical, and 
you know how that voice can be. It's just very harsh and critical and whatever. I had to face all that. And then in 1991, uh, I was wondering how this was going to speed up with Jesus and and Jesus was like, okay, paid off your student loans now with my help and you you are now ready to go out on the open road and I'm like, I don't like to travel. Uh, and oh, we're going walkabout, you know, like the Aborigine, you know, go out and just day by day, moment by moment, and this is in the United States. <laughs> I'm used to uh, schools and jobs and paying off things and buying things and having a bank account and everything and he's like, no, you gave yourself over to me and now, now we're going to see, see about that, see how you can do with that. So that's when, from like 1991 to 1996, it was, a, it was like basically a five year walkabout where I didn't have a job, I, I traveled over, around and around the United States and Canada, kind of like Peace Pilgrim, a very famous mystic in the United States, and, and he would direct, you'll go here, you're going to be going here. I, would, I was living pretty simply, stay at a hostel or something, shared spaces, people would invite me into their homes, miraculously, over and over, course groups, Oh, come home with me. You know, he was living without a house, without a space. There were times during those years where I had no car. Um, it was all over the place. It was, um, it was, a, it was development of trust uh, in a very accelerated way. Like the stages of the development of trust, I could just see them moving through there pretty quickly because people would say. Do you, are you like a minister? And I said, no, no, not really. Do you have a church? No. Organization supports you? It, you know, no, no. Do you, um, do you have a bank account? Do you have like CDs, money market, stocks, portfolio? No, 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 no. So you, you actually have no visible means of support. Yeah, no visible means. The invisible means are really good, but <laughs> this was the dive into the miracle of divine providence. You know, what Jesus had said, Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all else will be added unto you. I read those words like millions of Christians <laughs> around the world have read those words words from 2,000 years ago. Oh, take no thought for the morrow. Take no thought for the morrow. Well, how does that work with a career? I have a, I have a couple degrees, Jesus, and one of them is in urban planning. <laughs> planning, do you hear me? That's, the, that's <laughs> what the degree is in. I've got five years of training, co-op working. I've worked hard for that degree. That's not going to help you now. This is not a curriculum in planning. This is a curriculum in trust. Present trust. Let present trust lead the way. You see how opposite that is from all the training and conditioning. That would be absurd if you went to a CEO and he said, what's your resume? Well, actually, I was guided to delete it. <laughs> you tell a CEO that you've deleted your resume, they'll be like, we got a wild one here, you know. I mean, what's your chances on a job interview if you've deleted your resume? I remember the very time when I, I had it on a word processor, I'd worked for years grooming it and making it better and doing all those things with it, and then Jesus saying, and now delete it. It's like, I think I'm hearing you say, <laughs> delete, but you can't seriously mean <laughs> delete, it's like, delete, delete. So, so those five years of walkabout were actually practical experience of living the Course. 
of, of he's like saying, I want you to be a living demonstration. I want you to be a walking course. So I've had the same experience not too long ago when uh, on my birthday, biological birthday, down in Mexico, uh, a new movie had come out from a Mexican producer, a filmmaker called The Shape of Water. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Mm. The Shape yeah. of Water. Yeah. Guillermo. Uh, from down, I live in Chapala area and Guillermo lives in uh, Guadalajara. And he's made this amazing movie called The Shape of Water and I saw it. So on the biological birthday, I I was doing a retreat, like it wasn't a week long retreat, yeah, and five days, five days yeah. retreat, and I, I said, oh, here's what we're going to do today, is, is the guidance, I said, we're going to, we're all going to go to the theater downtown, um, Ihihik, and we're going to watch The Shape of Water, and we're going to get there early, and uh, the theater has agreed to give me the whole movie, the, the whole theater room, so I could do a setup of the movie. And then we'll, afterwards, there's a mall that I know that everything I think shows up in this mall. It's amazing. I think it would be nice to have an Indian restaurant. There's, there's an Indian restaurant. I, I would like to buy a car. A car dealership moves in. I, I love to watch movies. There's a movie theater. Uh, I mean, everything. It would be nice to have some burgers and fries. Burgers and fries. It's like there's a mall. I like orange, the color orange, the, the oh, umbrellas, and all the seats, and all the oh. seats in the mall. It's an outdoor mall too, with water fountain, kids laughing and playing, mm -hmm. and palm trees that are, have lights around them at night. It's like the mall of my mind. And so, so we'll go see Shape of Water. I'll do a whole movie gathering there, and then we'll go to to they call it my mall. It's just a mall. And so we did. And I did like, what was it, 20, 30 minute uh, yeah. setup of Shape of Water, which was a beautiful teaching device. We watched the movie, we all went to the mall, and everybody got all the kind of foods that they wanted, because <laughs> there was such a variety there. And we had such a great day, and, and Svava, who recently, when she was a child, she played the piano, and then because it was the thing of like kind of with the piano and competition and not really feeling the vibe, she yeah. dropped playing the piano. Learning the notes, all serious. She dropped it all because yeah, it wasn't so fun. As long as it was and, fun, yeah. but as soon as her parents made her play the piano and go to practice, she dropped it like a hot potato. And then suddenly, years later, it, she starts sitting down at the piano, with maybe 40... So, 30 years. 30, 30 years some later. years later, and just... Oh, all this beautiful music comes out. Like, where did you learn to play the piano? Oh, wait, I was maybe four, but I haven't played in 30 some years. And then she's da -da 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 -da, just going there. Like, she just <laughs> plays every day. And then start, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play the guitar. But she don't play the guitar. Picks up a guitar. Yeah. She's playing the guitar. Like, you know, you see these young little Chinese and Japanese. Children that are like doing all these, playing these instruments, it's not a time and space thing. It's not really learned. It's all in the mind. And so she watched The Shape of Water and then... It was actually, I can only imagine. The, oh, it wasn't about, Shape of Water. It was, yeah, it was, that was another one. Yeah, I but we went imagine. all together. It, just, it was yeah, at that movie. Yeah, yeah. I can only imagine at the yeah. same theater and you... Yeah, heard, it was because... You were talking to Jesus. Yeah, in, in May this year, Jesus told me to start playing the guitar. So I borrowed a guitar and I started playing and I started receiving songs like so effortlessly and in two weeks I received 12 songs and then we went to see this movie and it's about a man who is very afraid of singing but he has this amazing voice and he receives this song I can only imagine and uh, during the movie I said to Jesus, oh, okay, I get it now. My, my function here is to receive songs and sing, like a songwriter. And then I heard, no, Svava, that is not your function. <laughs> what? What is... <laughs> and then, all this. Yeah, and then Jesus said, no, your function is to be a demonstration of love. And it was such a relief for me. I don't have to do anything. It's all just given and in the moment and just 
it's a beautiful joy yeah, yeah. it's always yeah. Our, even our function it's always simpler than we can imagine you know we we hear the word function and it gets so associated with some kind of doing like we're supposed to uh, do something and even that was came in so unexpectedly yeah hearing receiving songs and playing the guitar and then s- singing and then yeah it's been a l- Jesus has used the music to undo a lot of things for me you know singing in front of people singing you know I am the holy son of God I had so much resistance just doing that in the beginning and you know speaking and singing I used to be so shy and just hiding in my apartment didn't even go out um, to the grocery store unless it was dark and no one really was outside you know it was so I was so in so much fear at one point but so it's been like used for undoing everything for me the music yeah it but it's not about the music yeah it's yeah. kind of a relief to start to think that whatever you did or didn't do in your worldly life really wasn't that important that there was a deeper lesson and even Helen Shuckman who was the scribe of the course at the end you know Jesus was kind of saying well done and everything and she thought it was all about her function scribing the course and he said no no it's I love you that's <laughs> that was the it wasn't even about a book. It wasn't even about words. It was always just about the love. But it's so, when we've been conditioned and we believe our worth is tied into being successful or being uh, playing a role to a certain degree or a certain way where we can say we're, we're a good father or mother or a good worker or a good citizen or you know all these concepts that, that are tied into worth are all part of the the decoy from be still and know that I'm God that the pre- our presence our very essence is is the meaning is the lesson and not any of the other things but it is nice to know that all the other things get used <coughs> to come to the awareness of I am that 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 nothing is is uh, irrelevant from the sense of forgiveness. That that forgiveness, it's the same purpose for all these images that, to just see their unreality, to see the false as false. And and I have to say that actually, in my experience, that that sense of detachment from the world is actually a feeling of of, of being done through or being used fully by the spirit. Like, for me, I was shy, I've now spoken millions and billions and billions of words all over the world. I did not like to travel. My sister and I did not like to travel. We were those kind of kids in the car, the hot car in summer, on the long trips. Are we there yet? Please tell me, you know, we would repeat over to our parents hundreds of times, are we there yet? When are we going to get there? We, we even refuse to go on the trips unless there was motels with swimming pools. We would we would say we boycott <laughs> summer vacation. We don't care about the family reunion, but there better be some and please and my mother was always in trying we were so bored in the car, she was like, I see something that you don't see and <laughs> the color of it is red or like ah oh, God <laughs> you know, because we were we were the <laughs> We hated to travel, and then that's why I laughed that the spirit would use me in, on a on a travel mission. <laughs> use the one that hates to travel. Oh, that'll be good for undoing. That's perfect for forgiveness. Moses stutters. Oh, that's perfect for delivering the ten, the ten commandments. We got a stutterer <laughs> over there in Egypt. You know the angels and Jesus are having a fun time with this whole thing, because their whole purpose is to help us remember who we are. And the ego's purpose is to try to convince us that we're something that we're not. And to get all bent out of shape about that. So, anyway, that's, it, that's just my feeling. Like, even on this trip, I, I got down to Mexico, and Suave and I got down to Mexico, and we were so blank. It was just so blank, like, okay, we're here in Mexico, we're in this amazing house, uh, that the spirit dropped in for us, and we're kind of okay. 
there's all these unwind your mind circles that mm. are from my book that are all over. And we're just sitting there very blank, and then all of a sudden it comes in very quickly that we're to go to Europe. I was to go to Europe, my friend Lisa, and then actually Svava went to Canada, Canada which was a major undoing. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus really <laughs> pulled her through the ringer up in, in Canada <laughs> before she rejoined. But, but I, I kept feeling like, uh, like the United States and Mexico is seemingly pretty far away. It takes a bit of a, some flying to get to South Africa. But I kept feeling like the first time that Louise and a, a number of people have kept inviting me to come to South Africa, I was in communications and some calls and some emails. And I think it was Henry down in Cape Town was one of them, the one who translated the Course into Afrikaans. I'd seen him at the monastery we have in Utah, and, and he said, you got to come, you got to come. So I was talking to a few people, and they said, oh, please come to South Africa. And I said, oh, that sounds like a good idea. And they said, but our currency is the Rand. I said, the Rand? Never heard of the Rand. It's not in Euros or Dollars, the Rand. That's just curious. They said, but it's a, it, at that time, they said, it's very devalued, it's everything, it's so, they said, well, we don't know if we can afford to fly you down to South Africa because of the Rand. Thought, the Rand is no obstacle for Jesus. <laughs> I don't think Jesus, I think he would laugh at this idea, <laughs> we can't afford and the Rand and all this. And so they said, oh no, we can't, you know. And so I thought, well, I said, okay then. I'll talk to Jesus about this. And Jesus is like, oh, yeah, no problem. We'll do a 10 country tour of Europe where there's a bunch of money. <laughs> and we'll just go around there and scoop up donations and euros and pounds and whatever. And, and we're not just going to fly you down there to South Africa, but we're going to fly three of your friends as well. <laughs> so we ended up bringing a delegation. They were concerned about paying my ticket. Yeah. And Jesus is like so abundant. Oh no, we'll send a whole delegation. It's the first time. So we actually did a whole tour. Cape Town, Joburg. And moved to the Jeremy. Jeremy was the one who initiated. Jeremy, yes, who's passed on. But Jeremy was very good. And what was the name of the? Moorfield. Moorfield. Moorfield Farm. Moorfield Farm. Yeah. That was key. And then um, Durban. Durban. What's the long? Cape Town and Jordan, yeah. and and Kirsten, Jason, Francis, and myself all coming down doing a whole tour of South Africa. But that's that reminds me of what the Course says, where Jesus says, "It's not that you ask for too much; it's that you ask for far too little." That always impressed me. You know, this is a world built on scarcity and lack. And then he's saying, it's not that you asked for too much, you asked for far too little. And that was a beautiful joining there. Jeremy, I know, was involved initially with it, and then many others. When we came to Joburg, you were yeah. very involved. I was just telling them how we were all at Patricia's, I think, and, and it was very tight, and Kirsten needed more space, and Francis, and then... You, yeah, it all just mm. came in. A sense of abundance, a sense of joy, a sense of spaciousness. Also I had all these body things going on. Yeah, I had a, a I told the whole story last night of the, I was supposed to get a, a root, canal. root canal in Mexico. And my dentist said, oh you need a root canal immediately. I said, I can't, I can't have a root canal immediately. I've got to go to Monterey for a weekend gathering and then I've got to go to the States and then I've got a 10 country tour of uh, Europe, and then I'm going for a tour of South Africa. And he was just shaking his head. So I went to the airport to go to Monterey, and it was like, oh, a little sore. And this, I'd been to an alternative uh, person the other day before, and they gave me a bottle, a jug of um, of colloidal silver. Say, so take a teaspoon here and a tablespoon, you know, this and this. So I I couldn't get it through security. So I checked the whole thing. I just Great. <laughs> I spent 20 minutes just checking the whole thing, colloidal silver, and I, I thought, 
no, this is what Jesus gave me for to make it through my gathering in Monterey. I'm not just going to throw it in the trash. <laughs> Armel was like, oh God, <laughs> you're going to poison yourself before, before the gathering. And, no, this is given to me. <laughs> this is going to handle the root canal. And the, it lasted me all the way t to Joburg. That chugging that whole thing on the silver. I mean, you follow the guidance, you know. I, I mean, that's all I can say. I'm not. I'm not a medical professional. I'm just a listener and follower. And then when I got here, yeah, you know, Patricia, she put me on her health insurance. If I went in the United States and somebody just said, "Oh, we're going to put," so here's an issue. We're going to put them on the health insurance. It would have just chased me out of the place, but, oh, okay. And they put me on her health insurance, and whoosh, I'm in, and then I got a dentist doing a root canal. There was, there was also an insect bite, I think, on that trip, perhaps a spider bite or something, and all kind of color, red, and discolors, <laughs> you know. It's, oh, no. I said, just maybe get, get some, some lotion to put on it. So they take me to the pharmacy, which happens to be next to a hospital, I think it was over in uh, Durban, Durban. Mm -hmm. and they, they go into the pharmacy. I said, you got some kind of a lotion or something for this? And the lady just looked at me <laughs> and she said, get over to the hospital and the emergency room. <laughs> I'm not giving you... So, but there, they, they gave me shots and did whatever. That, that was even part of the practicality of, of you mm -hmm. take no thought for what you should wear, eat, take no thought for the body. It's almost like it's just a dream. And Jesus and the Spirit can use the dream symbols because my function was to come down here and meet the people and share the joy. I mean, that's all I was focused on. And then it really had that quality of seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all else will be added. But I, I like how practical that is too because those are the doubt thoughts and concerns the ego will raise. Like if you go on this journey, you know, the thought of being homeless or I had all those thoughts when I was giving it all over to the Spirit. I was <laughs> quite, but what if, and what will happen if I don't have insurance, or don't have life insurance, health insurance, all those kind of things. And Jesus was like, yeah, I am your life insurance now. I am your health insurance. I am your employer. I will do the guiding. I will offer the instructions. I will give you what you need, but I will not have you linger in time and space when you are a child of eternity. When our source is an eternal source and you are not of time and space, I will not be giving you things. Don't think you're getting into manifesting and all that stuff. I'm not going to give you something that's going to have you linger in a in a place that's not your home. You have an eternal home, and and let's be about our our Father's business. Let's let's get with it here. There's no time to waste for any of us. Suffering is not God's will. Happiness is God's will. So for me, you know, it has been. If people ask me, has it been practical? You know, have have did Jesus ever really leave you out in the cold and forsake you? And I just have not had, since that first time of getting the course in 1986, I really, I really have not had like a why have, why have thou forsaken me kind of moment. Like I gave you my heart. That's what happens in romantic relationships, you know, it's, I give you my heart, and if it seems like someone steals it, or damages it, or whatever, then it's, that's the projection. But I have not had that experience <laughs> with Jesus. I've had a, it's been a very, very loving experience. And I feel he's always been there for me. Even when I would have symptoms, one time I seemed to have like, cold symptoms and you know they have these medicines that like fix NyQuil or whatever that are like knock you out when you when you've got all these symptoms like five symptoms at once and you feel like you're gonna die and then they make these medicines and so I've been taking some, 
some of the medicine, I know, it seemed to have like a high alcohol content too, although they don't, you know, you don't always read, you just, this will help you get through the night. That's exactly what I need, marketing, <laughs> it's telling me. But then I remember taking uh, this for a couple different times, and I remember one point my heart just started pounding and racing, pounding and pounding and pounding, and I thought, oh my God, I'm going to have a heart attack. And then I thought, Jesus, help me. And then, just like the water's calming, you know, back 2,000 years ago with the fishermen, it just, everything got still and quiet. And, and I actually had another time where I started, I started to feel symptoms, I started to feel nauseous, and I was really not feeling well, and then on top of it, I was cooking a plate of food in the microwave, and I'm like looking at this food in the kitchen, just going, oh no. And then I started to get this huge diarrhea feeling coming, I'm like, oh, this nausea, diarrhea, and then I just raced into the toilet as fast as I could, get to the toilet, got situated there in the toilet, and then my Course in Miracles lesson of the day landed in my awareness. Sickness <laughs> is a defense against the truth. As I'm sitting on the toilet with the diarrhea and the nausea, then Jesus is like inserting, well thank you, let's get back to the curriculum here. And then oh, I just let related thoughts come from that lesson. Where he says, it's as if love comes close to you and you're so frightened of the love that you like made we have a magic wand of, of a symptom or uh, to, to prove that you're weak and frail in the face of God's love and you do it. It's like you do it to yourself and then you forget that you do it to yourself. You even select, your mind selects the symptoms that you're going to have and then covers it over with a little bit of veil of denial and you quickly forget it. And, and I was on the toilet and I'm going through all this, I'm getting all these thoughts, the angels and everyone's with me and the Holy Spirit, and then I do remember thinking how much I love Jesus, how much I adore Jesus. And then I put Jesus with all these thoughts and I thought, either Jesus is telling me the truth right now about all of this that's going on in my mind. Or Jesus is completely insane and completely nuts, <laughs> and the world's right. <laughs> but it had to be one or the other. Either Jesus, whom I love, is insane, and he's trying to trick me, or what I believe about myself and my situation is right. Would you rather be right or happy? It was one of those kind of moments. And I really went deep into my mind at that moment, and that was a powerful experience for me, because that was my lesson of the day. <laughs> Sickness is a defense against the truth. That was, and then I had the, the point where I just went with the adoration and the love, and I, I, I actually verbalized the words, this is impossible! And mm -hmm. just like instantly, like the, the man with the warts, millions of warts on mm -hmm. Yeah. on him who was hypnotized and then mm -hmm. whew, the millions of warts just disappeared mm -hmm. that seemed to be uncurable and then the suggestion from the hypnotist came in you will you will grow new skin all these warts will disappear it was a hypnotic suggestion in the mind and this was the same kind of thing you have so, so this this is a tricky one and I'm sure that it comes up for everybody. It's one of the hardest ones, sickness is a defense against the truth. Because what are we saying? Are we saying that you, if you have any symptom in your body, it's, um, you know, because attached to it is a little bit of guilt and shame. That sickness is a defense against the truth. Or are we saying that the body, it, it doesn't matter if you've got these things. You can still have love and adoration and joy and all the rest of it. And still have symptoms, even cancer. 
point out that I think of somebody like Bill Fishman, for instance, who's you know has cancer. It's a tricky one, David, because what well, you're saying is you don't have any symptoms. But what what it is, it still comes down. I found to to, to let's get let's have a meeting of the minds. Like when I when you and I read the lessons, sickness one thirty six, sickness is a defense against the truth. We have so many meanings tied into that first word. And what the Course is really saying is, is that, uh, he says at one point, the mind that thought the body could be sick, is sick. The, let's go back with that one again. The mind that thought the body could be sick, that thought there were symptoms, that thought it the sickness was of the body, was, is sick. Well, okay, okay, that's pretty radical, but let's explore that one. The mind that thought the body could be sick was sick. What he's really saying, and this is the core thing, is that, that sickness actually has nothing to do with the body. Not, not partially, but zero. It sickness is of the mind. And he basically is teaching us that, that basically, if he, he uses two workbook lessons to do a whole dissertation on this, 163 and 167, basically saying that anything that is not supreme happiness is death. He doesn't even go into sickness. He says anything that's not supreme happiness is death. And then he, he throws in a few things to really spice it up in those two lessons. A little worldly pleasure, a sigh of weariness is death. He's not even saying a sigh of weariness is sickness, he's saying a sigh of weariness is death. So basically the ego is death, and the ego is a belief in the mind. And he's saying atonement, only atonement cures. That, that cure is a, is a word in this world that has lost its meaning. Doctors cure, uh, mentalist cure, hypnotist cure, and everything like this. Why is everybody always debating this cure word? Is because of the assumption that sickness has something to do with the body. And we can even go further than that. <coughs> what if there's a belief that death has something to do with the body? What if there's a belief, what if birth and death are both part of a hoax? What if the and birth of the body and death of the body are just two different opposing concepts, neither have a, a spot of truth in them, that both of them are equally unreal. So what this does is it, it starts to take all of our definitions, learned definitions, and it says, let's just keep lifting them to the mind. If a sigh of weariness is death or sickness, if a little worldly pleasure is is death. He's taking us towards, I call it mysticism, where he's saying, know thyself, you know, come fully back into the remembrance of thyself, thy Christ self and the Creator. And so, let's let's bring it again back to practicalities. I, we love to zoom it way up and then let's bring it, zoom it way back down. This is what I, you've heard me probably say this, but I, like with, with the program, 12 Steps, what do people do? They come together like this, they go around the room, and how do they start the meeting? Hi, my name is... Catherine. I'm a compulsive overeater. And I'm a compulsive overeater. Or, I'm, my name is so-and-so, and I'm an alcoholic. I just, uh, there's something there that's helpful about the admission of a problem. In other words, in 12 Steps, if you aren't willing to admit to the problem, you're not going to be very successful in the program. In fact, the program they basically works for those that want it to work. You know, why do some people go into the program and and keep on with the overeating or the drugs or the alcohol, and some go into recovery? That must be the prayer of the heart. It must be the ones that want to recover recover, and the ones that want to remain addicted, remain addicted. It still comes back to, to the prayer of the heart. So <laughs> if we look at it that way, 
what I use as an example for I've, I've said for all course groups that every course in miracles gathering could begin like with the program with a simple admission. Hi, my name is so and so, and I have a perceptual problem. I don't have any physical problems. I don't have any physical problems. Symptoms aren't physical problems. They seem to be physical problems, but if I don't actually have any physical problems, I don't have any relationship problems, I don't have any financial problems, I don't have any health issues with the body problems, why don't I have all those things? It certainly seems that way, it certainly seems like I have these issues. No, I have a perceptual problem. What does that mean? It means, first of all, you're hallucinating, you're seeing something that's not even there. In psychology, that would be hallucination. Second of all, you've got a schizophrenic issue, a sch some major schizophrenic issues, because you're listening to multiple voices. Every day, you're listening to multiple voices. And third, you have a, a very strong case of psychosis. And what is psychosis but a break from reality? If reality is divine love, then the human condition is what? It's a psychotic episode <laughs> that's been seemingly going on for millions of years. But the key thing in the symptom thing is, is I have to come to the admission that I have a perceptual problem. That if I'm seeing a fragmented world, that is a perceptual problem. But the only way that I can accept the solution for a perceptual problem, the answer for that, is I have to admit, that's where the 12 steps works too, you know, you have to come to admission that you're powerless at managing the addiction, that the course student simultaneously has to come to an admission that they cannot manage or understand or figure out the perceptual world that they see, because they're looking in Corinthians, you're looking through a darkened glass. You don't, humans don't see clearly. What I, what I, what I, what I find useful that has done worked for me sometimes is okay. So this is a dream, and in this dream we go to bed and we have another dream. That's a dream in a dream. Yeah. So in the dream, you have our dreams are populated by things we choose. Because I can dream of everything, but the source of the figures in the dream is me. So when I go into a dream, these symbolic things do symbolic things. So I talk to myself, and God talks to me through the dream, in like a combined conversation. And it's very, very rich in symbolism. You know, so afterwards I think, why was I dreaming that my teeth were stuck in the fridge or whatever, okay? Because they are symbols. Yes. So if I come to this world, which is another form of dream, and I see the disease and its symptoms also as symbols, then it could also have useful meanings for me. Does it make sense? Yes. So, the fact that I have diarrhea may be a symbol that I'm running around too much, or I'm not dealing well with nourishment, or, you know, but I can start disentangling what seems to be a frightening thing, is like I have symptoms. Well, you can think of it as some symptoms that are symbols. You know, and then cancer may be a symbol of resentment, or cancer may be a... Um, so, by, 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 because what we have is we have the body, and we have fear. And now I'm dealing with body cancer in the same world, and I'm not thinking that this is a dream. But I think even the symptoms can be useful. Yeah. So a loving God will give us useful symbol, symbols. But then I have to remember that I'm dreaming both myself and the cancer. So what am I communicating to myself by having this cancer? What is it a symbol of? And there's some ways of saying, okay, cancer is typically about depending on where I have the cancer. If it's liver, it may be anger. If it's breathing, it may be freedom or whatever. So I can start un untangling the symptoms as symbols in my dream. Yeah. Yeah. And do you have, what, do you have something to... 
I do. I, I don't know how much we want to go on about this, but so for me, everything is gently planned by one whose only purpose is my highest good. If something comes up that requires me to have it sorted, because it's and, and there's no fear involved. And this is a real case. Last Friday, my sister's my witness. I was in hospital for the day having something removed that needed to be for me to function better. I had a glorious day. For me, and I, and I said this, for me the purpose is how many holy encounters can I have in this day? Mm. And it was, I have to be honest, I had a really good day. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, and the job was done and you see, so I, I can't get into what did I do wrong? Yeah. And, and it's not a fear thing and it's not a it's just that's what's practical. So 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 then my question is, can you have the symptoms and, and deal with it medically and deal with it from the standpoint of you know, of the one who is in position just to just to my only function is to love. To yeah. love in the situation, maybe I'm here for the other patients. For the doctors. Yeah, I think that this is where the the deeper let go comes in because, you know, the course will even it's called a course. He uses the term learning. It seems like we can learn through the symbols. You know, that all seems practical, and then you get into the depth of unlearning. Um, simply do this. Be still. Lay aside all thoughts of of what you've learned of what God is who you are, everything the past has taught, forget this world, forget this course, and come with holy empty hands unto your God. When I first read that passage, my heart chords were just, it's all, Jesus was like saying, pay attention here, like I'm giving it to you straight, you know. Buddha had said empty the mind of everything you think you think and think you know. So if we use the examples you're bringing, that, that there is a part of the mind that will try to make some sense of, of the world. Some sense. That's why we have philosophies. That's why we, we have books filled with trying to make sense of the world. How did it come about? Science, the Big Bang. You could go through philosophy, spirituality, religion, science. There's all these stories about how did this happen. But basically what Jesus has said is you're still trying to reconcile or understand the impossible. There's one point where Jesus says, this world is backwards and upside down. Well, that reminds me of uh, Alice in Wonderland a bit. You know, when she goes down the rabbit hole and, and the sizes are different and it's such a different context. She's got the Mad Hatter down there. <laughs> we might say we have the ego to deal with. But this world is an impossible situation and and it can't be understood. So this is the first thing. I think this is why you're like looking for holy encounters and turning towards how can I serve, how can I share the joy, how can I share the love and light. It, the questions, even the questions about the symptoms, the questions about the body, the questions about... Um, in, in The Course of Miracles Jesus says, um, He's going to talk about ego dynamics, and he says, first of all, that doesn't make any sense at all. You know, we're grateful for Freud, we're grateful for psychology, we're grateful for psychiatry, but he's saying, ego dynamics? How can something that's, that's a puff of nothingness, that's a total joke, that doesn't even exist, have dynamics? You know, it's a contradiction in terms, ego dynamics. In this world, we, we go, oh, ego dynamics, yeah, let's talk about projection and denial. You see, it's much to do about nothing. Shakespeare had it right, that the world is much to do about nothing. So if it can't be understood, then it can be forgiven. But forgiveness is really seeing the false as false. It's not trying to describe or explain or figure out what cannot be described or explained or figured out. What you were sharing was it was beautiful in terms of the symbology, like if there's symbols, if you can start to see things as symbols, maybe they could be clues. And maybe the Holy Spirit can plant clues. Like a Star Trek episode one time, um, where I think it was Star Trek and Next Generation, and in the episode, the ship, the captain, all of them find themselves in this situation, 
and then the ship blows up. And then a little bit later they find themselves back in the identical same situation and they're all looking around and then the ship blows up again. <laughs> and then they go back around at another time and and the same and they all are about going seems oddly familiar and do you remember what happens next? Boom! The ship blows up again. So they come back around again to the same situation and they go there's a problem here. <laughs> it takes them a lot of time. It's like the human condition, you know, how many times do we have to incarnate and, and do this thing? But it comes around and they go, there's, a, there's something going on here. They're aware something's going on. It sounds like my, when I went uh, to Mexico City. <laughs> Oh yeah, our we loop. got in, got in a loop in Mexico City, and we couldn't get out. We kept going through the same loop over and over, and we were like, "We are not going to get to our destination if we stay in this traffic loop in one of the largest cities in the world." It was the same with the Star Trek, and and so in Star Trek they said, "We need to plant a clue. We need to plant a clue in the symbols yeah. Yeah. that will." catch our attention. So maybe if we catch the clue, we can do something different <laughs> and get out. And that's what we did. We were looping in Mexico City over and over and over and I kept saying, this is that Star Trek episode. <laughs> this is that Star Trek episode. We're caught in a loop and we can't get out. But we don't know what to do differently because we keep getting, you have to do this, you have to go in this lane. And finally we're, we're, uh, we meet some lady and, and she's like, seems like a key point in the loop and we're saying, we're caught in a loop and we can't get out and can you help us? You know, we reached out for help with this lady and she says, well, I'm sorry to say that you have to go in this lane, but just look for the workers in blue clothes. In blue clothes. <laughs> and we're like, thank you. We were happy to even <laughs> go through the loop again, just look. So then the next time around we're coming through and we're we're all like in the car like looking like this. And then we're going and then I happened to look back and I saw some worker with some blue on. We just passed them. And I'm like, oh I rolled out my window. Hey, hey, hey so back in the loop again. So now we've got look for the blue workers. And and then we went around again and we saw yeah, and then we the blue yeah, workers, after five times. and they said something like, "Oh yeah, you can't do in this and this. You've got to have some kind of a some card, a, some kind of a special electronic card." <laughs> and that was the gift. The blue workers gave us the gift. Bought we bought on the side of the road one of these blue cards and got us out. In the Star Trek episode, it was Data, the android, who was pretty sharp, who caught the clue that they all planted. And once he caught the clue, he told everybody and reminded them about that clue and then they, they got out of the loop. The ship didn't blow up. Now, what, what is that clue? From what your question is, the clue is that, that the only answer to a perceptual problem is, is a change of the purpose in the mind. That there will be no escaping the loop of time by changing anything in the world. You, you won't be able to change the dream, you can just change the purpose for the dream and that's where you're, I'm just looking for the holy encounters and how many holy encounters I can have and, and therefore you had a wonderful experience while something was being removed <laughs> the world would say, that's not a good thing. Things should stay with bodies. <laughs> But may, maybe not. Who, who, who makes that value judgment? You're saying, I, I'm in for a happy day, I'm not, I'm not concerned about that. And so, if you take it one step further though, then that, that, that a question about symptoms has to, has to become, seem to be irrelevant. Because those are the questions that I've been getting for 25 years about Ramana Maharshi and you know, yeah. those things come, and why did he have the tumor, and, and Doug Fishman, and the cancer, and so forth. Because it's still looking 
to the effect to shed some light on the cause. It's looking at for the, the definition of sickness. Yes. Yeah. And we assume it's the body. It but what you're saying, and what I agree with you, it's not. Yeah, it has yeah. absolutely nothing to do. Yeah. So you couldn't look to the effects to give you a clue yeah. to truth. Because he says truth cannot be described or explained, only experienced. So it must be that we get back into the holy instant and and our devotion is to experiencing the holy instant. Because that's where the whole loop of time comes in, you know, seemingly repeating the same mistake. Jesus says history would not exist if you didn't keep making the same mistake in the present. And then he has a whole section called the immediacy of salvation where he's saying, why would you look for like a f future freedom when you have cause for freedom now? Mm. So he's actually telling us, do not put your hopes and into the future to escape from this ego. That there, we have a way, just trust me, follow my guidance. Mm. I will point out the clues, I will take, give you whatever it takes to have that aha moment to go, aha, I've been looping. I've been looping. I love those I've looping been, I've movies. Been, I've been using spiritual searching as a delay. <laughs> yeah, spiritual searching. You know, that's one of the, the yeah. when I said when I've come in, I can't say how senior I am in course. Because it just means you're using spiritual search as a delay. Right. Because anybody can get it right now. Yeah. You know, and how much yeah. are you going to resist? So some people say, oh, I've been a th teacher for 30 years. Oh, so that's how much resistance you've gone to getting it right now. <laughs> that's it. It looks the whole around. It's from a, a, is that an advance or a, a retreat? Who knows? You know, who I think somebody would come in and get the course. It's like, oh, yeah, I know. I got yeah. all this stuff. Thank you, bye. Okay, yeah. bye. You know, so. It's funny, the book is this thick. And, and, and one time these people gave me this, this, I think it was a cassette or something years ago. And it was just these two guys that were singing songs from the course. And there was one particular song that I just got the biggest smile on my face because the book is this thick. And it was like, the, the line went, Do I want the problem or do I want the answer? Teach only love for that is what you are. <laughs> it's, a whole book. I little, it's like a jingle for, <laughs> for a commercial. And I'm like... <laughs> You know, because you think, oh, it's a big book, and you've got, oh, yeah. yeah. It's like this big job, spiritual awakening. And then you hear this song, do I want the problem, or do I want the answer? I feel like when you're looking for holy encounters, to just the joy of connecting, and so what, if it's a hospital, or who cares? Yeah. Is or it the cruise ship was the thing I Cruise ship, <laughs> yeah. it doesn't really matter. You know, that's just the backdrop, you know. Mm -hmm. That it's simple. We knew, we all know it must be simple. Mm -hmm. In the end, it's it, truth cannot be complex. We're, it's got to end with a, an aha, with a big belly laugh. Uh, you know, that's the world will end in mm -hmm. laughter. That's another line from the course. I was, oh my God, the world will end in laughter. I just that sounds so true. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can't I can't even say why, but you know, that's that's it. And, I get, and your email was so, I was telling, I read it to Slava mm -hmm. and Catherine about the, really about the letting go of of the world and just your sharing about the, what you just recently went through, you know, that was very much of, along the lines of, of not really looking for anything from the world anymore. And that's very precious. I used to say that years ago, I would say, I would say, if you want anything from the world, the world will want something from you. Mm -hmm. And I, it just came out of my mouth and I just was like, oh, because it, it's always like paying attention to what is spoken or shared, but that one really, that hit home pretty deeply. And then I could, then it started to make sense about giving my life over to, 
to spirit. Like, oh, that's why that was very gracious to say, hand it all over to me. It was actually a gift to say, don't want anything from the world. Look to me, look to the spirit, you know, in all things, and then you will receive the benefit of, of that inward looking and, and not um, seeking outside. Mm. So I'm very joined with that and, and Slava was, you know, she's been saying that for some time but, it, but especially coming down to South Africa and going on the safari, she was just like saying, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> all the animals were just reflecting that. They were all just resting and mm. crying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just things with the, the music and different things, you know, when everything just flows and just is like melting butter, then it's all smiles and all laughs. But but it seems like it's very subtle when we want something, we may not even fully be aware about it. But it's that's where the we were talking about the expectations mm -hmm. suddenly rise up from the slightest mm -hmm. bit of wanting. And then, I know that this, this dream character was named David, and uh, Eve, or Evelyn, was the, the mother, and Jack, or John. <laughs> These are very biblical names. Eve, John, and then, what did they name their son? David. And I said, where did that come from? Oh, that was after King David. David, oh, that King David, the Psalms. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Maybe this has something to do with that. I, Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And then I had a sister, and the sister's name, first name was Mary, mm -hmm. and the second name was Joe. <laughs> I'm like, what? The, the sister's name is the parents of Jesus. And then I had a psychic tell me, they said, um, with the tuning forks and all kinds of things, that I was like, whatever, half-brother, that was Jesus' half-brother. Well, it's just all symbols. It doesn't mean anything, but it's just symbols that there's a, there's a presence, there's a message that, that Christ is wanting to extend for us to have freedom and joy and happiness. And we're all part, we're watching that dream and we're watching the symbols come to us just to remind us that, that we have a very holy function of forgiveness and... So even if, even if we develop symptoms in the body if that come from the mind, I can still look as that as saying, somewhere my mind is going in the wrong direction. My split mind is now even splitting my body in something the body doesn't want. You know, so um, there's always splits going on. Even in this dream, there is splits, splits. Um, in the New Testament, I always think in Genesis, the, the most beautiful symbol for separation is the snake because of its tongue. You know, it's always speaking for separation. Come separate, 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 separate. And the, that tongue is such a powerful symbol for come separate, come separate. Does it make sense? So, I mean, I think there's everything for me is really full of symbols because symbols actually speak even more powerfully than language because every symbol can be a metaphor and from that metaphor I can take so much. So when I dream of a, when I dream, I can be chased by a bear or a crocodile, but I'm choosing the one in the dream that's most useful for me to communicate to myself. Because in my dream, when I'm in a body and I'm dreaming at night, it's still a communication from me to me. It doesn't matter which level, God self, higher self, lower self. But I choose very appropriate symbols because I choose them. You know, in a communication with God, I'm saying, I'm trying to communicate things to you that you have to wake up now or that you should think of something, you know, in that dream. But it's communicated not typically with words, but with symbols. And they are very powerful communicators. And they so, so, so in a dream, if I, I did dream, and it's called microanalysis, where this woman actually looks at your dream 
and she says if it was a blue fridge it wasn't just the fridge you chose the word blue so what is what did you chose the color what does that color mean to you because you put it there you put blue you choose even the smallest details in your dream you put there because you want to communicate to yourself so you can just look at the basic dream but you can also miss all the small clues in it so um i think they they you know if we can look at this dream i can say why am i in the room with you and this what is this a symbol of that wants to either get me back or drive me further away does it make sense so in this separation this for me is a massive power meeting of the similar minds that are really just looking for union peace and happiness so um i could maybe even say why is this what has it got written on it catherine okay <laughs> you know bad. why is there a baobab tree here in my dream because this means something the mirror covered in leather behind you i could actually start analyzing things in this world as symbols that I'm using to communicate to myself anyway. I would say what you're describing really beautifully articulating is is what I would call like a rung on the ladder. Yeah. Like in other words, um if if you were if you were drowning in the ocean and a ship went by, um you would be grateful if somebody threw a rope over the side or a a one of those Float, floating devices or a floatable boat or anything and I feel like that's a, really a good analogy for how the course is in other words the course is like a book and then people find all these contradictory things that are in the course well he's he's contradicting me one thing he says this and then he comes clearly contradicts himself and I had a group of students back in the 90s and they were always chasing me around saying how Jesus constantly contradicts himself and how can I believe in this book if uh if he's contradicting himself and i said what are you doing why are you analyzing the course i said it's just a bunch of metaphors and it's like if imagine if you were in a pit and you're like help help and somebody throws a rope down you know it's not the right are you color gonna, are you gonna, right is this not the right color or you know you know it's that whole story in the east about you know hanging on the side of the the the, the cliff and can somebody help me you know and I'm here. I will help you. A voice comes, "Let go." Can anybody else help? You know, <laughs> you see it, 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 it's there's an, an analysis of <laughs> of, of the, the voice solution. of yeah. the solution. And so when I see it, it's like metaphors and what I've seen is what Jesus really wanted me to do. He's like saying, "Listen, trust me and get into the miracle." And David, you've been a great analyzer. You were in engineering, you've been in urban planning. You were a good analyzer. You really dealt with mathematics and all these things. Now, I want you to trust me to get into the miracle, put the purpose out front, setting the goal section from the course, put the purpose out front and trust that everyone's playing their part perfectly. You don't have to even figure it out. You don't have to analyze it. Try that. Well, I got so much into that. I don't know if you've seen some of these movies like Being There with Peter Sellers, Chauncey Gardner where he's kind of pretty clueless and Mr. Magoo. I got more into that. Just recently we were up in um we were up in Europe in Portugal and the spirit was using us. We were being done through in such a full way that we were just from morning till night holy encounters and we were just so full into the miracles and everything that there was one point we were in the car and i was with three other people and i said what day is it as i actually had lost i have no clue what day it is and i look at the other three people and they're all like they're all in it with me <laughs> we've got four clueless ones now in a bmw that we've rented and none of us <laughs> knows what day it is not even a guess okay. and and we don't have our our phones and our gadgets with us so what day it is so everybody was guessing it was when okay wednesday that sounds good when wednesday is it we weren't even close we weren't even close it was saturday we weren't even close to the day we four of us had lost track of what day it was now this i think happens when you get more into the miracle there was another time in my life where I remember 
I got up in the morning and I went to brush my teeth and I brushed my teeth and it's just a sink in me and I'm brushing my teeth and I rinsed, I have a cup, so I rinsed my mouth up and as I rinsed my mouth up, the sink turns bright red. Bright red. And actually, honestly, my first thought was, this is the most pretty sink <laughs> I've ever seen. This is what I'm talking about, about letting go. We've, we've been learning too many things. When you brush your mouth, or whatever, any orifice that you have, red stuff yeah. is not supposed to yeah. come out. But actually, I was at the point of my mind training when I just, da 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 brushing my teeth, happy, happy day. Pretty. That was the, actually the first thought was how pretty the sink was, <laughs> and and actually what that's starting to point towards is there's all the rungs of the ladder, but the whole ladder is to take you up into a state of the glory, and the glory is independent of form. The glory is not circumstance dependent. So in the end. Analysis is always of the ego, and the whole purpose is to transcend the ego. But what you're describing is the very helpful use. It's like the Holy Spirit using what the mind believes in to take the mind on a journey without distance to a goal that's never changed, but it still has the practical value. In other words, it's like that that uh, Madonna did a, an album called Ray of Light, mm. traveling down the road, watching the signs as I go. That's just a, a natural part of, of awakening, is you watch the symbols until the point comes where you start to realize that the first lesson of the Course is nothing I see means anything. Which really is saying nothing I perceive, not really visual, Christ vision, but nothing I perceive. And so that's where the trust comes in. And that, that's really beautiful that you're sitting next to each other and you're so fully articulating, oh, Follow the bricks, follow the yellow brick road, yeah. follow the signs and the symbols, and you're clearly saying, do I have to? Do I have to? Can't I be oblivious <laughs> to all of them? Isn't it possible? And I'm saying, that's good to follow the symbols, and it's oh, it's good too to, to be sure. in that place where you, you don't want to follow the yellow brick road <laughs> anymore. But you're into the joy, you know, it's, it's like you, you're showing up irrelevant to what the symbols are. And so, this is, what a yeah. beautiful gathering. I, I <laughs> just <laughs> mentioned which road you take as long as you get there. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I love, think I that, love the analytical thing as well. I mean, I'd like to get to the, through the cause. And say, okay, I'm going to study time and the collapse of time, you know, and then I'm going to realize that the holy instant happens first, and then the mind splits, and then the body arrives, you know. <laughs> so that's like a whole analysis to tell me how to get back. But the other road is to go through it with the heart, just to say, I'm going to love, I'm going to love, I'm going to love, yeah. I'm filled with love, I'm. Yeah wonderfully warm and loving and if that's another way I mean there's no right. single way because yeah. there's so many of us <laughs> they can't be a master way you know they must be your way so yeah anyway lovely that's a good, thank you what so a beautiful much. time we've had mm -hmm. it's almost like we came to a ah oh. thank you thank you thank you thank you <laughs> oh, that's a lesson <laughs> Yeah, we have to go. Okay. It was so beautiful to meet you. <laughs> and I will certainly be in, we'll have lots of contact with one another. Oh, sure. Lovely. This wasn't a meeting for just today. Yeah, uh, wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. I'll get contact details or websites, I'm sure. Yeah. How yeah. oh, lovely. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you for filling my day. <laughs> because I've been saying, I'm not finding the way, I'm not finding the way, give me something. Okay, just be patient for another two days. <laughs> yes, but I'm not quite <laughs> patient. <laughs> you know? And then I say, why did I leave my keys? Why did I, why do I have to do this? And he says, would you like to be the universe to be different today? To be honest with you? Or can't I have one exception? I love that dialogue. No. Yeah. There's a dialogue. Yeah. No. No. Can I find my keys first? <laughs> Patience.
Thank you. Thank you. so many people of all over the world in this yeah. room in Westie. Yeah. Oh, thank you. 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 Thank you.